Great, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. It seems a, a fitting opportunity to come and talk to you about supply chain and procurement in a post-COVID world uh, against the backdrop of uh, fuel shortages and CO2 shortages that we're de dealing with in this country at the moment. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, as mentioned, my name is John Calder, Partner and Practice Lead uh, for Supply Chain and Procurement at Beringa. Uh, we're an award-winning uh, consultancy with a difference. If you want to know more, have a uh, look at beringa.com to find out. Um, today's um, story will cover kind of three chapters, really. Uh, the first of which was some reflections that we put together last year uh, immediately after the, uh, the COVID hit in terms of the impact it was having on supply chains, uh, gleaned from a number of our clients and a number of webinars and blog blogs that we've published, uh, and some reflections on how that's evolved over the last 12 months or so. Secondly, I'll move on to share with you the um, uh, NHS vaccine supply chain story um, and uh, the, the journey through that over the last 12 months or so. Um, for those of you who've been vaccinated uh, in the room, I'm sure you'll be interested to find out uh, some of what happened behind the scenes. Uh, and then lastly, some reflections about actually how that supply chain model in itself uh, plays to some of the levers of the, the post-COVID supply chain that, uh, that we recognise. So I'll leave some room at the end for questions uh, as we go. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. So these are the six levers that we identified last year, and, and maybe just to bring some of these to life for you. Um, in terms of sort of the, the impact of COVID on the supply chain model. So firstly, really uh, around protecting the core and how to protect the core. Uh, and to share a few of the challenges that some of our clients uh, faced last year and how they responded to that. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. The first of which was uh, Coca-Cola drinks company, a number of other drinks companies in a similar situation. Out of home market fell off a cliff, nobody buying any drinks in any bars, restaurants, cinemas, etc massive pivot in the supply chain to focusing on the core SKU range um, and really slimming down to a core SKU range and making sure that that could be delivered out across their supply chain network. Um, similarly, um, uh, in the disinfectant space, uh, Reckitt Ben Kiesa, again, cleared 40% of their tail almost overnight uh, to bring Dettol front and center of all of their manufacturing planning, clearly Dettol running off the shelves globally, uh, and really a massive pivot from a supply chain point of view to protect that core product at that individual point in time. And similarly, if you look even outside of the manufacturing sectors, um, the retailers, you were all involved in trying to get uh, food onto your, into your cupboards at that point in time after the initial hit and a huge slimming down of the range that the retailers were arranging to allow them to continue to supply some of that both in, in the stores when they reopened and in the, in the direct to home channel. Um, and also even in the, uh, if you look in other sectors, we were doing work with the likes of Anglian Water actually literally picking up the phone to suppliers, are you impacted, can you still supply parts and equipment for us to keep the lights on on the network and the infrastructure that we're running. In terms of how that's prevailed and how that's played out since, I think we're seeing a big uptick in manufacturing reviews in the supply chains that have manufacturing as a component. Um, we, we commented on the observation of perhaps a more global type, a move to a more global local supply chain model to protect that core. And certainly, I think uh, the amount of inquiries we're getting at the moment around manufacturing and reviewing the manufacturing operations is testimony to that kind of protection of the core and how that might move forward in the longer term. Technology. We had a number of stories from our clients where the CEO, the CFO was ringing the supply chain director and saying, where's our stock? Do we have any? Are we going to be impacted? How's this going to play out for us? Uh, and obviously, the dependence on technology to, to support some of those um, uh, information feeds. Um, Huge amount of frustration, I think, coming from the board down in some of our clients where years have been spent investing in supply chain technology um, to answer some of those questions si simply and quickly, uh, which couldn't be answered when, when COVID hit last year. And I think we've seen um, over the last 12 months, I think, a further investment that was already taking place fairly significantly in things like supply chain visibility, track and trace to understand exactly where stock is as it's moving through a supply chain. Better connectivity with your suppliers. So it, that interconnection point of whether you're dependent on suppliers for, for supplies of products, making sure you understand what their position is. Uh, and then I think increasingly what we're seeing, and again, this already predates COVID, but a big shift towards looking at automation in the supply chain, particularly warehousing operations, opportunities in transportation, and some of the, the more back office functions as well. And again, similar to manufacturing, a, a big sort of uptake in interest in that space at the moment. Um, direct to consumer and e-commerce. Um, again, huge pivot overnight. I'm sure most of you in the room ended up buying stuff online that you didn't ever anticipate to buy before. You've got some of the big manufacturers, the likes of Unilever doing direct-to-home ice cream. Whoever thought we would see that pre-pandemic, but shops were closed, people weren't buying, couldn't get into the supermarkets, and looking at innovative models for, for accelerating D2C 
uh, and e-commerce. Um, and similarly as well, looking at the, the retailers, uh, particularly in the UK market, huge pivot to the, um, to the, uh, the in-home and the home delivery network. We did a lot of work with one of the retailers there, restructuring their entire supply chain to support that. Um, and an incredible statistic that still blows my mind today is the, that ju just really encapsulates this was the movement to uh, e-commerce models in the eight weeks after COVID hit in the US market was faster than the 10 years of growth prior to the eight weeks after COVID hit, which just really shows that huge overnight pivot. And I think you, know, you can see already today uh, certain products now people expect to be able to buy through online channels that, that they weren't able to before. Collaboration in the supply chain. Um, oftentimes, this has taken a long time to bring together. There's more of it, I think, as people look at the fixed assets and how do they get better with that, whether they own them themselves or they're, they're using them with others. We brought together innovative partnerships when, when COVID hit. So we had uh, Eon and Boots partnering together to use the Eon home delivery network and white van fleet to switch on a home delivery channel uh, and to support home delivery channel. And other examples you would have read in the press, EasyJet staff on furlough going out to support uh, some of Ocado's operations uh, as well, and really collaborations from across sector and within sector that you might not have expected to see, and done in a really just do it overnight type model, um, which hopefully presents a, a big opportunity going forwards for how supply chain collaboration can look in future. Sustainability, um, you'll have heard of Build Back Better and Greta Thunberg um, yesterday, uh, pouring scorn on the, the notion and the opportunity that, that exists there. Um, great example here with one of our clients, we were working with F1 um, as the pandemic hit. Uh, you'll know that the race calendar was paused for a period of time, um, and what prevailed afterwards was a, a pivot overnight to a remote broadcast operation. F1's commitment is to be net zero by 2030, and 40% of their footprint is their logistics operations to move that caravan around the world of broadcast operations and the team's equipment, uh, and the teams themselves, of course. Um, and uh, they were able to switch on a remote broadcast operation, cut the attendance at the races themselves when the circuits did get going again to 30% of the people that had previously attended and make a massive step forwards towards a net zero 2030 ambition off the back of COVID and one that they're looking to retain as a go forward model for how they run their operations uh, in the new post COVID world. And then lastly, for the connoisseurs amongst us, some interesting reflections that our teams had around companies' ability to respond to the pandemic and Certainly those clients where supply chain and procurement as functions were close together, typically either under a single board member or very close in the organization, were much better able to respond than those, for example, where a procurement function sat under a CFO, a supply chain function sat under a COO and slightly different objectives. And will be interesting to see in the years ahead around um, the longer term evolution of the model and whether the supply chain and procurement functions do come closer as a result of it. So those were some reflections that we had sort of fully 12 months ago um, and also some, some developments since. If I move on to tell a little bit the, uh, the NHS vaccine story and then I'll bring this, this story back against some of those six levers as well. So um, our involvement and my personal story in this started at March list last year as COVID hit. Uh, my wife was eight and a half months pregnant uh, and we were watching with uh, some concern the situations in Italy in the hospitals and really not knowing what was gonna happen uh, as COVID descended on us. And I had the opportunity through some work with colleagues we're doing to get involved with the uh, UK PPE program. We had a chat as a family about whether that was the right thing to do uh, as the baby arriving in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and thankfully for those of you that know the UK PPE program, it was the best decision my wife ever made that I didn't get involved in that. So we took a side step on that for six months uh, and wind the clock forwards to September. Um, the COVID program was already two or three months und uh, underway at that point in terms of the vaccines uh, sourcing through the vaccine task force uh, and through some of the work that we, we'd done over the summer with the government, we had a chance to get involved with the NHS uh, with supporting with the COVID vaccine uh, rollout. So we arrived into two, two work streams at that point in time, uh, really the supply chain side and the procurement side. Um, we, at that point, uh, inherited a design that was waiting for two or three key decisions to be made. Um, firstly, we were waiting for MHRA uh, and Pfizer to conclude the um, planned timing. So they're in late phase um, rollout of the clinical trials at that point in time. So we're waiting for some indication of the timing. Um, we were waiting for some indication of the handling requirements. You will have already in the press the challenges of the Pfizer minus 70 vaccine. We didn't know what the handling requirements and restrictions were gonna be on that. 
Um, and we were waiting to find out in terms of the NHS whether the GP network would have a role to play in rolling out the, uh, the COVID vaccine program. They were anticipating a huge winter spike in flu uh, at the time and couldn't commit to that uh, as little as five or six weeks out from go live. So that left us with a pretty open supply chain design. Matt Hancock took to the lectern after some Pfizer leaks uh, in the press around the readiness of the product uh, in late uh, October uh, and committed that the NHS would be ready for a 1st of December go live. Uh, and we were five months away from, um, from go live at that point in time without a supply chain design finalized. And what follows was really um, a, a, a rapid acceleration of uh, bringing together a supply chain to support this. Uh, two or three sort of key decisions, I think, that were taken at that point. So we decided to separate the vaccine supply chain from the non-vaccine supply chain and run them as two different operations. We decided wherever possible to detach this from the regular NHS supply chain that was already under stress going into a, a winter, uh, winter pandemic season, if you like. Um, and we looked wherever possible to leverage existing supply chain capability that was out there in the market. And that led us to a, a really furious period through that uh, November timeframe with uh, a, a series of tenders that brought out to market. We brought online two of the leading wholesale pharmaceutical distributors uh, in the UK uh, to support the vaccine supply chain. Um, warehouse space was at a premium at this point in time. This is just before COVID, uh, sorry, just before the Brexit deal was done. Not a lot of warehousing space across the country. Managed to find a 3PL partner with a warehouse location in Coventry to support the non-vaccine supply chain. Uh, and we also um, were able to leverage pockets of the BAU supply chain as well, the business as usual supply chain to support point areas and really brought together in an accelerated and furious period through those four or five weeks. Some of the challenges you can see down the bottom, if I jump to that, this was without precedent. We normally, as advisors and contractors in these sorts of programs, we say, well, we've seen it over here and we did it this way. We've seen it over here and they did it this way. There really was no precedent. We looked at Israel, we looked at the US a little bit, but they were at the early stages of their own rollouts. And we had to design this really from scratch, if you like. There were 2,000 sites, we're approaching 2,000 sites. So when it was finally decided, the GPs were due to come online to support this delivery. Um, yeah, 2,000 sites were required to be stood up uh, and operated larger than any of the UK retailers or equivalent to in size to any of the UK retail supply chains. Um, in addition to the vaccine, we had to deliver over a billion non-vaccine supply chain items as well. Uh, no mean feat in itself. Uh, and also the NHS as a badge and as a brand is an umbrella for a very complex organization underneath that needed to work in harmony to deliver this across seven different regional teams, 29 different ICS networks, 223 different trusts, and 1,500 partially independent primary care network sites which cover the GPs and the community pharmacies. So we, as now into early December, about a week away from go live, we suddenly realized there was huge public interest in this thing. We needed to stand up a customer service desk. We had all manner of inquiries on all manner of questions from GPs, uh, MPs, ministers, all wanting to know what was going on, uh, were we going to be ready? And then it happened. 8th of December, you'll all remember it. You can see the screenshot over the, on the right-hand side um, of Margaret Keenan receiving her first Pfizer jab, first person to receive that anywhere in the world, and the um, world's media descending on that hospital in Coventry. Uh, we were asked that morning to, to dial in and watch BBC News, and I'm not afraid to admit there was a lot of tears in the house across the program uh, as that, uh, that first jab was administered that day. Um, that was the start, clearly uh, a lot still to do. Um, Prime Minister set us the challenge shortly after that of getting to the care homes as quickly as we could. We never expected to get to care homes until AZ came online. AstraZeneca um, vac vaccine was a much easier vaccine to handle, um, but not due to, to go live until January. Um, and in, we were asked to see if we could get Pfizer into the care homes uh, and a rapidly uh, designed supply chain of cool boxes, fridges and freezers and gel packs and everything that was needed to get Pfizer safely into the, into the care homes was assembled uh, and went live three, month, three weeks early. We had a pause for Christmas. It wasn't much of a Christmas, if we're honest, uh, for anybody, for that matter, for those of you that remember that far back. Uh, and then really what followed in January was a huge ramp up. So we were only live in a few hundred sites at this point and a massive ramp up. Supply started to come online as manufacturing got more reliable uh, and the Vaccines Task Force did a fantastic job of, of supplying in from the manufacturers. And what followed is probably best described as flying the plane whilst building it. Um, rapid design of people, processes and systems to support this supply chain operation as it scaled. Uh, and that was really a bit of a, uh, a, a, a sprint through January to get that whole supply chain really stood up at scale. 
Um, starting to get into a slightly stabler period, uh, we went through a series of commercial health checks from the uh, Cabinet Office and Complex Transaction teams. It gave a, a strong green light considering some of what had gone before on the PPE and test and trace programs. Um, we started planning second doses. Was it going to be 12 weeks? Was it going to be four weeks? Was it going to be something else? Huge operational complexity around that. And we started tentatively to look ahead to the future business as usual and booster campaign phase that we're now in and what this might look like as we retended some of those initial contracts uh, that were put in place for six months. Second doses went live, and our massive major milestone the program hit at the end of April to start opening up the country was to, um, a week early, hit that uh, target of cohort, uh, cohorts one to nine all being vaccinated uh, and done a week in advance, uh, and some of the video sn snapshot there from the Prime Minister's thanks into the program. Um, I would say it got calmer, but not any easier through the spring period. We had all manner of uh, different challenges through spring into summer. Uh, we had some interesting geopolitics playing out with some vaccine nationalism and some toing and froing between Europe uh, and our own country in terms of what was coming, what was not coming, and the pressure, particularly on AZ at that point in time. We had the weather, two or three rounds of snow. We had uh, delivery vehicles of vaccine being pulled out of the snow by tractors. Uh, we had the sewage blockage, for those of you who also remember that far back, so a number of our consumables and equipment were stuck in the Suez Canal for a series of weeks uh, that presented its own headache uh, and left us short of supply on some of those areas. Um, we had the under 40s, uh, a very different group uh, than we'd set up with before. Uh, mixed levels of demand, we had to set up a demand work stream for the first time uh, as people were a bit more reluctant to come forwards. We also had to offer a much more compelling offer to the under 40s, much more flexible, the whole grab a jab model, uh, and much more agility through that supply chain to, to support that, um, that, uh, those cohorts and to bring them forwards. We were asked to surge into variant locations. You remember the early stages of Delta up in Blackburn and Burnley and most of the Northwest and uh, surging vaccine in there. Again, a different challenge into the supply chain. And now we're into the realms of 12 to 15 schools and boosters, which are in themselves presenting their own uh, unique headaches. Um, but we did it, 31st of January. Uh, we're all here. It's lovely to be face to face again and actually seeing the, the benefits of society opening back up as, as that program rolled out uh, and phase two, as we know it, completed. So where do we finish up? 93, as of yesterday, 93 million vaccines and counting uh, across the UK. Um, the supply chain operation is really quite remarkable given the immaturity of this supply chain. 99% vaccine delivery on time in full, 91% within a one hour time window that we committed to the uh, delivery sites to support that. Next to no damage and loss, that was a clear mandate from the ministers to us, we could not damage this precious substance and next to no damage and loss through the supply chain. And obviously critically, PHE's latest estimates that this program saved 105,000 lives across the UK, which yeah, it just still blows my mind in terms of the, uh, the scale of the achievement. So hats off to the NHS for any of you that ever work in the, this environment, uh, a truly phenomenal organization, some fantastic people, uh, and a, a real pleasure to be a part of. So I guess just lastly, to bring this all back around and some reflections, I never expected to be taking the two stages of our own journey through uh, the COVID pandemic of our early reflections in those first six months and this supply chain that we built, but actually, the NHS vaccine supply chain actually touches on all of these levers and, and represents some interesting reflections for the future. So firstly, in terms of protecting the core, I talked earlier on about the vaccine nationalism. You'll have read in the press, the UK is now heavily focused not just on fill and finish operations being grown in the UK, but actually the vaccine manufacturer. Um, AZ is the only one to date that's had any UK manufacturing footprint, but rapid catch up from GSK and others to follow. Uh, and then government, long-term government strategy around the um, manufacture of COVID vaccine within the UK market. Also, the PPE program is already on a journey in terms of UK make. That's a, a government banner that you, you'll see in the press sometimes as well. They've done a similar pivot with PPE and protecting the UK supply of PPE and pivoting more of that to, to UK, uh, UK manufactured model. Technology for us, um, data was key. Um, the head of the program, Emily Lawson, the, the SRO uh, or previous SRO now, uh, was a huge advocate of a data analytics platform supplied uh, in uh, by a third party, uh, referred to affectionately as Foundry. That blew open an entire visibility, not just of the supply chain, but of all of the site level information. And Nadine Sahawi, the vaccines minister as was, commented that this program had more data than any other government program he'd ever seen and was absolutely critical to that laser focused precision rollout through the cohorts that we were asked to do. 
Beyond that, our systems were evolution, not revolution. Those early days of flying the plane whilst building it were spreadsheets, were chaos, if I'm absolutely honest, from a supply chain point of view. Only now, one year in, are we putting in an ordering system. Believe it or not, that's all been manually managed to date. And um, we're looking ahead to the future. And, and the system's narrative has really been about evolution, not revolution. But also where we had focused and where we will continue to focus is on that visibility. So what was moving through the supply chain that I talked about before and the customer centricity and giving the sites visibility of what was coming to them so that they could plan their clinics in behind. The third lever I never expected to apply here, but actually on, when we step back and look at some of the asks that were given to us, we developed a direct to patient supply chain model. So whether it was going into care homes in the very early days and the bespoke requirements that that had, um, whether it was going to Ramadan clinics in the height of Ramadan to try and drive uptake in some of the um, minority areas as well, um, which we were asked to do. The under 40s I talked about earlier on with the grab -a jab and the pop-up concept and aspects you may not consider in this model as well. We had to go to homeless communities as well, which had a, a different challenge in itself to, to reach them through a, a much more flexible direct-to-patient type model rather than relying on the patient to come to us. And a fantastic legacy and opportunity for the NHS going forward is they never had that reach before. The NHS supply chain today ships to hospitals. It doesn't even go to GPs. That's an independent model. So the NHS has reached further with this program than ever before in terms of its patient reach and a fantastic legacy and opportunity for, for the program and for the NHS supply chain going forwards. Collaboration existed throughout this. We had two competitive uh, medicines wholesalers working in tandem. Um, uh, at times uh, semi-harmoniously, I think, but in general, pulling for the greater good. Uh, we had uh, a new 3PL brought in, third-party logistics company working in tandem with a logistics company that was on their business as usual supply chain, and again, supporting for the greater good. And I mentioned earlier on that complex NHS ecosystem that really had to come together to deliver this. And again, some great collaboration stories that might not otherwise have happened and represent some opportunities for the future for the NHS. Sustainability in our lanes is not just environmental sustainability. This isn't the most efficient supply chain. Cost hasn't been a focus for us, clearly, given the, the backdrop to this. Um, but we are looking to a more sustainable future, better efficiency, less environmental impact. But sustainability also through the lens of sustainability for the NHS. So how does the NHS learn from this? How do we build skills in supply chain as a core area for the NHS operation, where they haven't traditionally been that strong? And then lastly, the reconnecting supply chain and procurement. For any of you familiar with the NHS ecosystem, um, the supply chain model there is uh, governed by an organization called SECL. Um, they operate both the supply chain and the procurement side, traditionally over-indexed on procurement, largely a big buying organization that it's done very well. And some key learnings, not just through the vaccine program, but also PPE uh, and test and trace before it for where that supply chain and procurement operation through SECL's, SECL's model can come together more effectively in future. So that's our story, the three chapters I promised to share with you, the reflections on the post-COVID supply chain, the uh, NHS uh, journey through that, uh, and then actually the NHS through the lens of those levers to bring it to life. So I will pause at that point and invite any questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that people will be, will be thinking whilst watching this is, this is probably, I don't want to give it the label, but probably one of the most difficult logistics and supply chain challenges that's ever been certainly successfully attempted. Um, but what can CPOs of other organizations take from this to improve their own operations? Good question. I mean, in part, the six levers points to, to some of that. But I mean, I would say we use the term a lot within the program, agility and resilience. And it is very difficult, I think, to deliver both through a supply chain, both a resilient supply chain that can stand up to everything that has been thrown at this, but the agility to reach those, some of those direct-to-patient uh, models that I mentioned just now. And I think for the supply chains of the future, everybody's been buffeted on a day-in, day-out basis by different crises. You need that resilience. And on the other hand, customers are asking for more and more in terms of the agility and the service offer that the supply chain offers. So I would say in a nutshell, agility and resilience is a great legacy from this. Others have attempted it, others have been successful from it, but that to me is the, the supply chain of the future uh, to stand or everything that we, we're seeing today. So. This is a bit in the weeds, I just think it's interesting. Um, we had Jackie Rock speaking yesterday mm -hmm. who ran Test yeah. and Trace or runs Test and Trace. Yeah. Um, are all of these completely separate things? So, so there's no, 
I, I, I say this as if it's a criticism, it's obviously not, but there's no like one supply chain organization that's running all of this. Great question. So NHS has a business as usual supply chain that existed before COVID. That's run by SECL that I mentioned just now. That still exists today that keeps the lights on in all your hospitals, etc. cetera. Um, PPE, tried to run through that, didn't work. You saw the army get called in last April when that was all blowing up. An independent supply chain was set up for that. Test and trace, independent again, but quite a different requirement, very sort of van fleet operations, very niche. And we have used a bit of the PPE network, a bit of the BAU network, and built our own effectively. And the long-term question now facing us is, how do those come together? And what is the long-term need for these three or four partially independent supply chains that have been uh, implemented through the COVID, uh, COVID 12 months or so? so. Thank you. I would just say, if you haven't seen Jackie Rock's speech yesterday, it'll be available on demand. It's, it's very good. It's, it's worth a watch. And we'll go to Slido now, where people have been asking questions. Sure. Um, in terms of pivoting strategies based on the impact of COVID-19, what do you believe has had the most irreversible shift? Good question. Um, I think... I mean, if you look across beyond supply chain, the, the flexible workforce model uh, across societies all over the world is going to have an impact on all functions. And I think supply chain is no different. I talked earlier on about sort of the, the movement towards automation that predates COVID, if you like. But I think there is an opportunity and a legacy that will come from the COVID times of a much more flexible workforce, which supply chain was already heading that way with um, the likes of what Uber's doing in terms of some of the flexibility in, uh, supply, in labor availability and things like that. But I would say that probably uh, in terms of sort of flexible, um, yeah, flexible uh, employee models within the supply chain function is irreversible, feels irreversible to me. So. Someone's asked the question, um, would you say that COVID-19 has had a positive effect on accelerating advances within supply chain? Good question. I would say definitely it has brought budget and focus in the boardroom to supply chain. That is without question. Hopefully that will endure and remain. I think supply chain was already in my mind on a journey from back office to front office for some of the reasons we just talked about over the number of years, but definitely boardroom investment. Um, yeah, I'd, it feels like it's, to, it's given it a seat at the top table. It's pretty much headline news almost on a weekly basis at the moment, and that's a great legacy and an opportunity from a supply chain point of view uh, for, the, for the years ahead, I think. John, this has been fascinating. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.